years on a major study of the subject. We asked him to explain his findings and to test them out in practice at a school in Manchester. Here on the edge of the big inner city housing estates of Mossside and Hume is Trinity High School. It's a mixed comprehensive for 11 to 16 year olds and it's a Church of England school, though as a matter of policy it admits some children of other faiths. By all the usual measures, Trinity is a successful school. It had a positive report from the government inspectors, the HMI. It's got a good reputation and it's popular with parents. Almost as many applicants were turned away last year as were accepted. And the students themselves are, for teenagers, enthusiastic. Do you like the school? Yeah, it's really good. What's special about it? Um, I don't know. The teacher's really good and there's loads of computers and that's what's good about it. It's really, you know, high tech. Do you school. have to work hard? Yeah, very hard. <laughs> I'm in first year. So you've only just come to the school? Yeah. Do you like it? Yeah, it's brilliant. It's brilliant, is it? Yeah. Well, it's quite good. Everybody gets on with one another, you know. Even though there's so many races, they all get on. No racism at all. Some teachers are strict, some are not. But if you come to think about it, when you get the punishment, it's fair for what you've done. I think they, they stretch you well, but they don't push you too hard. But they, they give you good opportunities to make the best of what you're doing in your work. What about the teaching? Is that good? Yeah, especially maths, because normally we just do boring things like adding and subtract, but here we do investigations and whole hours on investigations and just general non-boring things. So how does a school like Trinity achieve its success? Most people agree that good teaching is the most important feature of a good school. But what makes good teaching? Here in the Learning Resource Centre, first-year pupils are taught basic study skills, how to research and evaluate information, and how to present their work. What does this show about the school? I think a positive attitude on behalf of the whole staff towards young people, and a positive attitude towards learning, that learning can be fun, and that it's worthwhile. Here, for instance, pupils are learning how to learn, and that that's an important message to them. What about academic expectations? Parents often worry about those. Yes, indeed, and HMI are always saying that expectations are too low. I think expectations are crucial, and a school staff that can get the message across to young people that they can learn and that they can achieve is on a very strong wicket. What size is it, big or small? Small. small. What shape was it? Yeah, and we felt the end of If expectations of high academic achievement are important, how can teachers get this across in the classroom? If you're a pupil in a class and a teacher asks you a question and gives you a long time to answer and helps you with the answer and then praises you, that's one set of expectations. If, on the other hand, the teacher asks you the question and goes off to another pupil before you've even had time to say a word, then that's a very definite expectation, a low expectation that you're getting the message about. Professor Mortimer's views were confirmed by Her Majesty's inspectors in a major review of secondary education published earlier this year. The inspectors praised lessons which were relaxed but orderly and teachers who could arouse pupils' interest. The way things are taught can also provide an incentive to learning, according to Professor Mortimer's findings. One of the interesting points from the research is that young people like doing practical things. Not surprising, really, given that they spend a lot of time just sitting around at tables and chairs. They actually like doing things, and they learn a lot from it. It's a point the inspectors also made in their report last month on GCSE. The more practical teaching for the new exams, they said, had boosted performance. But practical methods are not always appropriate. And, Professor Mortimer says, the good teacher needs to be flexible switching from one method to another, as and when necessary. ...are the same. Then you are sure that all the water has gone, right? Now that's the process, in fact... That Sometimes, whole class teaching is the most effective way of conveying information, or of leading pupils through a problem. ...if it's a neighbour's house, then surely 
even if you're not close, you have some sort of relationship with them. It's a friend or someone of his family. To develop oral skills, discussion work is useful. Yeah, but it's actually presuming that you're her age. No solo vida. No solo vida. Segunda clase. Segunda clase. And even old-fashioned repetition has its place. En la cola. Detrás de los paquetes. Good teachers, the research suggests, also recognize the need to make clear the purpose of a lesson and provide feedback to pupils so that they know what they've achieved. Okay. Question six. Why especially in the first two years of the war was it particularly important for the government to issue posters like this? Lee? Well, there wasn't enough, there was this shortage. Do you think this was just true of Britain? But there's more to a good school than classroom teaching. Professor Mortimer believes that attention must be paid to the development of pupils as individuals. What does this mean in practice? This is the uh, first year block. What's so special about the way they treat their 11 year olds? Well, I think they take a lot of care of them. This starts before, before they come here when they can visit the school with their parents. They can visit in school time and see what it's like. Then when they actually come here, they keep them in this block for a good proportion of the week. They do that because lots of first years are frightened of the new school and they can stay here together. And also because they've come from all over the city, they then develop some sort of cohesion uh, as a first year group. Concern for the individual shows in other ways too. In concern for equal opportunities, for instance. It's not unusual these days to find boys doing home economics. <laughs> Girls, though, often need encouragement to work in technical areas traditionally dominated by boys, a self-imposed disadvantage that shuts girls off from many technical careers. Equal opportunities are also vital for black and Asian pupils. At Trinity, 25% of the pupils come from ethnic minority communities. Fostering mutual respect comes high on the school agenda, and ethnic music classes are an enjoyable way of getting to know a different culture. Question five, which she did not, okay? okay. A stage can be illuminated. Children with special needs are another minority. Trinity houses a special unit for visually handicapped students. Their presence in the school is consciously used to help other pupils develop a caring attitude. Of course, not all schools are as lucky as this. Trinity was particularly well-funded at the time it was set up four years ago. But with or without extra resources, the fundamental aim is simply to get pupils to respect each other and to develop their individual potential. And the school's caring attitude is reflected in the pupils' behaviour. This is an interesting thing. You don't see it always in schools. Pupils' possessions left out in the corridors. It's a sign that there's a high expectation about the behavior of the pupils, and correspondingly a trust by the pupils about the school. And that shows elsewhere as well, in an absence of graffiti, absence of damage, absence of litter. This is a school where students actually use the litter bins, and there's an encouraging lack of graffiti. How does the school achieve this level of responsible behavior amongst its 900 pupils? Michael Evans, the head teacher, explains. Well, I suppose there's an understanding that you can't have any learning in a school if you don't have good order, so it's um, of prime importance to us. But it's not derived by a set of rules. We aim to establish in pupils a set of high expectations about the way they conduct themselves, their attitude to others, the attitude to property. There are no rigid rules at Trinity, just an expectation that students will behave sensibly. And although there are punishments, the emphasis is far more on rewards. 
What would you say the overall ethos of the school was? A respect for the individual. Um, a respect which builds on our understanding of what it is to be truly human. Uh, and a respect which shows itself, therefore, in understanding of other people and in mutual respect within the confines of, of this building. Those are very important ideas for a school to have. How do you get those ideas across to parents? Well, it starts right from the time when they're first expressing an interest in the school. Uh, we try to build a sense of partnership, a sense of understanding of what we're about. And it's important to include the parents because they spend, the children spend more than three quarters of their waking hours actually at home and not here. So we need their involvement, parental involvement, in the educational process. Once a week, there's an evening meeting of the Trinity Association. We recognise as a secondary school, we have to do things to bring parents in. In a primary school, parents meet at the gate. We have to engineer ways in which parents will meet. And so we have, for example, a Tuesday club, a, a social club for families, where they, where they can come and use our facilities. The Tuesday club at Trinity is popular with parents and students alike. Special attractions are laid on for them. Foot. Other. Lift. Foot. There's a keep fit class run by the school chaplain. Who's a woman, by the way? Uh, legs together, roll back, bend your knees, and lift, and roll back, lift. At these Tuesday night sessions, pupils and their brothers and sisters can enjoy facilities which aren't available during school hours. And both parents and pupils enjoy a session on the electronic keyboards under the guidance of the music teacher. <laughs> Trinity is one of a growing number of secondary schools which seem never to shut their doors. And the sense of involvement this creates is very clear. Look, Marie's down. By 8.15 in the morning, quite a few youngsters are at school already. Some work on the school allotment, something of a luxury in the inner city. Others join in the daily basketball practice. This and other out-of-school activities all show the level of involvement in school life. But is this just a reflection of the fact that Trinity is a church school? There isn't anything that we're doing here that if I were head of a county school, we wouldn't also be trying to do. But the answer has to be yes, because there is a commitment. Um, the, the, the school, in a sense, was an act of faith. It's a commitment which clearly springs from shared values, but not just those of the Church of England. Here are three of the prayers that would be said in the sukkah. Baruch Hashem. I'm reminded that our Christian roots lie very deep in the Jewish faith because those words of blessing over the bread and the wine are almost identical to the words we use to bless the bread and wine in the Christian Eucharist. It would have been quite wrong for the Church of England to have set up a school on the edge of Moss Side and Hume, which wasn't welcoming to all faiths, in such a way, and set up in such a way, that we could see greater understanding ourselves through the beliefs of others. Whether it comes from a religious base or not, a common sense of purpose is important to any effective school, according to Professor Mortimer. And it's the head teacher who must establish this and set clear objectives for staff and pupils. Professor Mortimer and the HMI agree on the key role of the head. I think it's crucially important. Heads need to have a vision and a plan. Sometimes you get heads who have all the vision, but no idea how to get there. And sometimes you have it the other way around. Very often, 
even their style of running schools looks very different. Yes, it does. And uh, there's no clear way of running a school. A good head, though, manages to lead the staff and to share with the staff in the management of the school. It's crucial decisions have to be made, and the head has to decide which ones she or he should take themselves and which ones they need the staff to take so that there's an ownership within the school. I think the head's a model. The way the head deals with the teachers is often the way teachers will deal with, with pupils and the way older pupils will deal with younger ones. And in the end, of course, it does all come down to the pupils. Are they actually enjoying school, Professor Mortimer asks. Is it fun? Attendance rates of 95% confirm that pupils feel pretty positive about Trinity. Do you like the school? Yeah, it's a good school. It's a good place to be, to learn things and just enjoy yourself while you're at school. The teachers and the pupils are really friendly towards one another and there are a lot of good relationships there. The teachers are really good to get on with, you know, okay. no problem with them. Good laugh. It's a very good atmosphere. Um, the teachers generally are all right. The, the kids, as all kids, are very loud. I came in first year, and of course, and it's really good fun because you know it's new, and I think you know it's because it being it, you know mixed school, you can get more done. That like you can do woodwork, and the boys can do home economics. So I think that's good in a way instead of going to all girls school because you don't get the chance to do different things. I think there's lots of variety. I think it's a very good school. I like it very much. Because it's like a big community and everyone gets on all together. Many of the features Professor Mortimer considers important in a good school are hard to measure. But there are a few obvious ways of assessing school performance. One way that parents often judge secondary schools is through the examination results. Is that actually fair? Well, it is and it isn't. This is tricky. In some ways, the examination results are the obvious ways. But you see, the problem is that all schools don't get the same sort of pupils. Some schools get pupils who've had every advantage and have had terrific primary schooling. Other schools take pupils with lots of disadvantages who've already shown learning problems. Now, to compare the examination results of one such school with another is totally unfair. And will the tests which the new Education Act introduces give yet another measure of that sort for parents? I think those tests are important and they'll give parents information about their own children. But in terms of the parents using that information to judge the school, then they're all the same difficulties that I referred to earlier. Of course, there are inspectors' reports on individual schools. How helpful are those to parents in evaluating a school? I think they are useful. I mean, there's some limitations about them. Uh, there's only 400 HMI, and the number of times they can get round schools uh, aren't very often. Uh, so parents are lucky if they find there's been an inspection in recent time with up-to-date information about the school. The other thing is that some of the information inevitably is subjective because HMI are just getting a snapshot. They're not there for the five years. They can't see the development. They can't see the progress that's taken place throughout the school. The new Education Act gives schools more responsibility for their own management and money. In the future, school performance may well be used as a measure of efficiency. But if exam results and inspectors' reports have their limitations, what other ways are there of measuring school success? Here at the Department of Education,